Well, thank you for joining us today to discuss what one of our leading medical journals, The Lancet in Infectious Disease, has referred to as riding the corona coaster of uncertainty. Today, as the following slides will outline, we want to try to give you some clarity of where we're at and where we seem to be going. I should start with there's no conflicts of interests. The slides I'm presenting are my own or those modified and referenced from various experts. And the content that we're presenting is made available for informational and educational purposes. I'm not intending to diagnose you with anything or, or treat you, but again, to provide educational information that I will hope may help you better understand where we are at and perhaps even help you in your journey towards fighting off this COVID-19. The objectives and outline will include four main questions that we'll be addressing, including what do we now understand about COVID-19? How can I protect myself from COVID-19? And who is at highest risk for COVID-19? And what can be done for immune support? Let's start out with a case report. This is a a 36-year-old female that presented to our emergency department with a progressive illness of nasal congestion, dry cough, headache, and fever, and she was on day 10 of her illness. Her illness had actually began in London one to two weeks before, on, and she had presented on March the 5th to our emergency department. Turns out this was our first case of COVID-19 not only for our healthcare system, but for the state of Nebraska. She had underlying medical conditions as noted there, including diabetes and underlying chronic lung disease. On exam, she was febrile, tachycardic, tachypneic, and had an oxygen saturation of 80%. And as we'll come back and discuss, this is referred to as the walking or the silent hypoxia that she did not really feel that short of breath when she presented and was up sitting and alert and, and so on. With three liters of oxygen, her saturation rose to 93%. She was overweight as noted. She had a negative, what we call viral respiratory panel that looked for all the seasonal respiratory viruses. I was called at that point in time by the emergency department and we discussed her presentation and elected to proceed ahead with a chest x-ray and, and CT scan. She was admitted in what we call special droplet and contact precautions. This chest x-ray shows what we describe as bilateral opacities of the lung. You can see the white fluffy uh, opacities here, the lung normally is filled with a lot of air, ventilating those 600 million alveoli or air spaces you have. And she had these bilateral, again, opacities, primarily kind of what's called ground glass to what we call consolidating, consolidating where you begin to lose the anatomy of the lung. She had a CT scan that shows more dramatically, this being her heart here along the patient lying on a table, her head outward, feet towards me, the right and, and left, as you can see here, and this one cut through the lung, showing again these fluffy opacities bilaterally, which are both ground glass and these more consolidating opacities. At that point in time, we interpreted this as being consistent with COVID-19, she was admitted had diagnostic tests, including a nasopharyngeal specimen. And within 24 hours, we had our answer. Indeed, she did have COVID-19. Because of her failing respiratory status, she was transported to the University of Nebraska at that time. You can see here, this was a, actually a picture from the Omaha World Herald, which you can look up, which was published actually later on May the 17th, where she and her father were reviewing her story. But here she was being transported 
uh, from our hospital to the university via this isolation pod. Well, she went on to be on the ventilator for 18 days, was finally extubated, and then, then went home. So she was a survivor of COVID-19. Since we first saw this patient, as you know, we've had an ongoing, now what's defined as a pandemic of COVID-19. And this is a dashboard you can look up from John Hopkins, and this is updated even by the minute. If you go in as of June the 14th, you can see worldwide it's estimated we're approaching 8 million cases with over 400,000 deaths worldwide. As of the 14th of June, we had over 2 million cases with over 100,000 deaths. And in Nebraska alone, we've gone from our first patient in the beginning of March to the 14th of June, over 16,000 cases now documented in Nebraska with a total of 215 deaths. Well, let's just briefly review some of the basics of what we now understand about this virus. We now refer to this as COVID-19 or coronavirus disease identified in 2019 and more specifically in December in the Wuhan, uh, China area. The virus was named in mid-February as so-called SARS-CoV-2, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2. Frequently, we just refer to this as COVID-19. We now understand this is a pandemic and has the potential to cause severe illness, especially in vulnerable patients. The transmission is still somewhat problematic. In general, we believe this is spread by larger droplets, those larger than five microns in size that are dispersed into the air. Although it's plausible that there are smaller aerosols that can be spread, and we'll come back and discuss this. By definition, we have defined close contact with this virus as being within six feet of somebody greater than 10 minutes when there has not been personal protective equipment like a mask and, and eye protection for the uh, healthcare worker or the person that is in front of that infected person. And as we'll come back and discuss, we are now advocating universal masking to decrease that risk. Fomite as a source of infection has continued to be also somewhat problematic. It is believed that the virus can get into the environment and this has been documented and survived potentially for hours depending on if it's a hard surface, a porous substance. It was, it's been shown that it can survive on steel, uh, harder surfaces perhaps for up to three days. It's uncertain though if you touch that and then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth how infectious that is, but that is where, when we come back to the guidelines emphasizing how important it is not to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth because that potentially is a mode of transmission. Another area of uncertainty continues to be the frequency of asymptomatic infection. It's presently estimated that about 40 to 44 percent of individuals when you test them are asymptomatic certain percentage of those are what we call pre-symptomatic, and we'll come back and discuss that. It's been estimated that perhaps up to 40% of all infections can be acquired from somebody who is shedding the virus and has asymptomatic infection. I've also seen a, from a modeling that perhaps 10% of people account for about 80% of all infection. So again, an area of uncertainty. The incubation period has been pretty well defined presently in a range of two to 14 days with a median of about four to five days. In other words, you're exposed to the virus and after a median period of about four to five days, you begin to develop symptoms if you're developing symptomatic infection. This cartoon um, shows, and this was taken from up to date, showing the uh, cartoon of the virus with the structure shown here with the so-called S 
are spike proteins coming out from the virus, the envelope protein with a bilayer, uh, bilayer lipid envelope as shown here, and then with and this all protecting then what we now understand is the RNA, the genetic material, the genetic code of this virus, which is associated with what's called a nucleal capsid protein. This is now what we understand about the so-called docking mechanism of this virus. There's the spike protein on the viral surface, and it docks with what we call an ACE2 receptor, as shown here, such as in the lung epithelium. You can see the, the ciliated epithelium here, and this so-called ACE2 receptor, which actually turns out plays a pretty important role in helping modulate inflammation in our body, but, but this virus will attach and enter into the cell. And since, like all viruses, this virus cannot exist outside of a cell, and specifically in this case, cannot exist outside of a mammalian cell, and it must then enter into a human cell, such as this lung cell, to be able to replicate and live and survive. It turns out these ACE2 receptors not are only present on our epithelial cells, including the upper respiratory tract and the lung and the gastrointestinal tract, but they're also found in our inner so-called endothelial cells, endothelial cells, which are found throughout and line the blood vessels. What's the origin of COVID-19? What is our present understanding? And this also is uncertain at this point in time. We do know this is a virus that has an animal reservoir and like the four common seasonal coronaviruses as shown here, which we saw all of these this, this past winter in the Omaha area. And then in 2002, the so-called SARS-CoV-1 virus, which came from the bat and the intermediate host here was the civet and this pan, this kind of an outbreak if you will died down in 2004 and then 10 years later so-called MERS or the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus came along with the intermediate host being the camel and this is still an ongoing endemic infection in certain countries such as Saudi Arabia. SARS-CoV-2 is believed to have originated from a bat. It's still uncertain what the intermediate host may have been. We do know, though, this seems to be the bat that serves as a source or reservoir of COVID-19, or SARS-CoV-2, and that's the so-called greater horseshoe bat, as shown here. So this turns out it's a zoonotic infection, and like the majority of emerging infectious diseases we have seen over the last few decades, this is a zoonosis. It turns out it remains, again, uncertain. We, we know the first cases were identified in the, the Wuhan fish market, but as I've at least been led to believe, this particular horseshoe bat is not a part of the delicacies that were being sold in that Wuhan fish market. In fact, the closest this bat may have come to that market was about 500 some miles. So again, raising concerns about was it the fish market? And as you may have heard, was it an accident uh, in, in a local biosafety lab uh, at the level of war? Again, we just, we're just not certain about where the actual true uh, outbreak was initiated what is the clinical presentation of COVID-19? Well, this has been referred to as a body snatcher with a spectrum of illness. And as we've led you to believe, not only does this attach to the epithelium of our body, again, respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, but to the blood vessels, the endothelium. And now as we understand the lung may be a portal of entry for this virus, throughout our body and to all the various organs, including heart, liver, kidney, brain. The course of this infection is shown in this slide. One is infected, 
Primarily, we bleed through the respiratory tract. About 80% of those individuals who become symptomatic, again, about 40 to 44% may remain asymptomatic, but 80% who become symptomatic have what we call immune system success. They're able to prevent this virus from spreading from the upper respiratory tract, the gateway of entry into the body, their immune system, and we'll come back and discuss this, but the immune system is balanced, it's able to mount an appropriate response, and thus the virus is halted at that so-called gateway. About 20% of individuals, though, go on to develop more serious infection where the virus has descended into the lung and then again potentially throughout the body. And this then leads to hospitalization with about 6% of patients overall are approaching a little bit over one-fourth of that 20% ending up in the critical care, being more critically ill and, and ending up potentially on the mechanical ventilator. We now understand this disease goes through three stages. Stage one, the asymptomatic stage where you have been infected with the virus, the stage two, which is the non-severe symptomatic phase. Again, about 80% of individuals remaining relatively, or having a relatively mild or moderate disease and not requiring hospitalization and recovering from their infection versus around 20% are now gonna evolve into a more severe respiratory inflammatory phase or what we refer to as a hyper inflammatory phase or a so-called cytokine storm. And Dr. Lapine, who presented this slide in one of Mark Hyman's webinars, I, I kind of like this analogy, the cytokine storm is like a tornado that is coming or has developed within you and releasing its damage and so-called collateral damage, which are all these so-called cytokines that trigger then more and more inflammation and thus a vicious cycle of, of damage. The pattern of disease progression is shown here, mild to moderate, again about 80% of individuals with about 20% developing more severe, or around 6% maybe critical illness leading to either recovery or death. And as we'll come back and discuss just this week, the CDC published the United States experience through May that they compared patients that survived versus those that died of this disease. Those that survived had a um, relatively healthy um, metabolic uh, state versus those that died, and it was about 20% of those with underlying chronic medical conditions, 20% of those with underlying chronic medical conditions like heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes. Those with those chronic medical conditions, the fatality rate was 20%, 20%, versus those that did not have the chronic medical conditions, the fatality rate was in the range of 1% to 2%. So indeed, this is a virus that's more lethal than influenza. Influenza has a fatality rate about one in a thousand versus again, the statistics we're seeing here, it can range anywhere from 1% up to 20% or more. Well, what are the symptoms of COVID-19? Fever, shortness of breath, and cough are the three main symptoms that we have focused on earlier on in this pandemic, but we now understand there's a whole spectrum of symptoms. And that relates to the fact that not only the upper respiratory tract and then the lung, but the entire body can be affected by this viral infection. So again, the triad of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, but we also now understand what's called anosmia and agusia, or the loss of the sense of smell and taste or altered smell or taste. And I've seen individuals where that was the only presenting sign or symptom and that's all they had as a manifestation of their infection. Potentially sore throat can happen, diffuse muscle aching or myalgias, the chills, rigors, headache. I have a patient in the hospital now that had an ongoing headache uh, 
for up to 10 days, a relatively severe headache, and that was all his presenting sign. He actually had a negative COVID-19 test, and then he finally ended up getting fever, and then a repeat test was positive, and he's now in the hospital receiving some of the treatments we'll come back and discuss. And yesterday he was doing push-ups in his room and feeling much better. So that, at the age of 72, that's a, one of our success stories that we're seeing. Nasal congestion or rhinorrhea, GI symptoms, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea because the virus can, again, attach to these so-called ACE2 receptors in the gastrointestinal tract. I've had patients tell me about the profound fatigue, acute prostration they develop, and this can linger on then after uh, recovery of the respiratory symptoms. Mental status changes, confusion, related in part maybe the metabolic changes, but also to how the virus appears to be able to get into the brain and cause infection in the brain. And chest pain and pressure, atypical presentations of heart disease. This was a slide that the World Health organization presented based on, as you'll see, uh, 55, almost 56,000 laboratory confirmed cases. They do not define at what point in the illness that these symptoms occurred or if they followed these patients along, but they just simply presented that a percentage based on that population, of percentage of fever. And as you can see, not everybody was reported to have fever, at least with this particular presentation. Dry cough, fatigue, and you'll see shortness of breath fell down here, although m most of our patients who are being hospitalized now will have fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And fatigue, speed of production, some of these other signs or symptoms. And at that point in time, the loss of taste and smell had not even been identified. Some of the signs of COVID-19 we've seen, blue lips, uh, such as our patient presented with who initially did have blue lips because she had this oxygen saturation level of 80 percent and normally it should be running more in the range of 95 to 100 percent. Red eyes or conjunctival injection is shown here. The COVID toes is shown here and I, one of my dermatologists said she's seen about five patients that have reported or presented with these so-called COVID toes. The, the dark reddish, the bluish discoloration. Uh, and as we'll come back and discuss this, probably is a, either a manifestation of the hyperinflammation or of what's going on in the circulation, the smaller blood vessels of the toes and the so-called clotting or thrombosis. This is one of our patients that was also a success story. He presented initially with one week of a rash that was generalized over his extremities and trunk. And this was taken about day uh, six of his uh, uh, hospitalization, it was beginning to fade somewhat, but kind of a, uh, a macular uh, diffuse rash as shown here that would not blanch. And a, a spectrum of rashes are now being reported, including hives, macular papular rashes, and, and so on. Well, when should you call your health care provider? I should add this presentation is an expanded presentation I gave to a, uh, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, it was a national presentation, and we were focusing on our primary immune deficiency patients that we see and helping guide them in terms of not only the presentation of COVID-19, but when they should be calling their healthcare provider. You should call if you have signs or symptoms of COVID-19, and in general, we're advocating tests and don't guess. In general, the healthcare provider, you're calling should guide you in terms of this is something that requires your being seen in the office or via telemedicine or perhaps going directly to the emergency department. If you're at a point where you're having only mild or moderate disease, and this would be a setting as we'll come back and discuss that we're encouraging our, especially our vulnerable patients that have a pulse oximeter at home, which you can purchase online for about $30, and to monitor their oxygen levels because that becomes the critical metric, if you will, to, for de determining should they come to the office or should they go directly to the emergency department. If there's only mild symptoms, we then reinforce following the CDC prevention guidelines of self-isolating, good hand hygiene, uh, physically separating at home as possible, uh, looking at the home environment, its, it's ventilation, who's, 
living in that living space, uh, and closely monitoring, constantly in those patients to monitor closely for any shortness of breath, persistent chest pain, confusion, the blue lips, the COVID toes as we presented, or maybe even the red eyes, prompt clinical evaluation, and possible hospitalization if any of these more alarming signs or symptoms develop, including the shortness of breath, persistent chest pain, again, confusion, blue lips. Anyone should be clinically evaluated if they have a higher risk factor, especially if they're in any of the vulnerable groups, which we'll come back and discuss, perhaps at least via telemedicine, if not office or emergency department. So the triaging is centered around the severity of findings. And again, ideally, even maybe with a pulse oximeter reading identifying shortness of breath, difficulty breathing again. You know, if the initial oxygen saturation they're measuring is less than 95%, and ideally they have the, their baseline readings, or if they have progressively higher acuity level symptoms or signs, those are the patients that are going to need, if not telemedicine, hands-on. With the emergency signs and symptoms where you need to direct a patient to the emergency department, if they're having trouble breathing, persistent chest pain or pressure, again, new confusion, mental status changes, altered consciousness, as we say, blue lips or a face, and an oxygen saturation less than 90%, regardless of the severity of shortness of breath, realizing you can have saturations maybe down to 80% or lower where you have just silent hypoxia, as we call it, or the walking hypoxia. Those are the patients that are in urgent need of medical attention mental status changes, and again, some of the other signs and symptoms as noted on this slide are those that would direct a patient to the emergency department. Well, where are we at with diagnosis of COVID-19? Well, there's two major tests and actually a third that we'll just mention. Presently, we are trying to directly identify the SARS-CoV-2 RNA by a so-called nucleic acid amplification test or a PCR test. This is a nasopharyngeal swab. We also now have serologic tests available where we can draw blood and look for the presence of an antibody against COVID-19. As of this week, I've been led to believe the American Red Cross, if you go in and donate blood, they are now screening you for the COVID-19 antibody. We also can do this test through our reference lab presently. This is a, uh, a cartoon from the New England Journal that was published in the past, actually during the uh, 2009 H1N1 influenza outbreak, demonstrating um, how that nasopharyngeal swab is collected. You can see it kind of goes way back to the nasopharyngeal area. I've had patients refuse this test or repeat tests after this was done. Is there is some discomfort, but it's so important to get a good specimen, as shown here, to get the most accurate results. This is an ongoing area of concern, and this was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine um, recently, entitled The Variation in False Negative Rate of Reverse Transcriptase Polymerase Chain Reaction Based on the SARS-CoV-2 Tests. Uh, by time since exposure, and you can see this table breaks down the day of infection here. Uh, this would be the, the day one after you're exposed and infected. If you would do the PCR test, the chance of this being what we call falsely negative would be 100%. In other words, if you went in, I, I had direct exposure, I was in direct contact with somebody, more than 10 minutes without any protection on within six feet, and I'm concerned in my infected, if I would go in and get that nasopharyngeal swab, my chance of that being positive, even if I'm infected, is zero, zero, with a false negative rate again of 100%. So if I then go in day four after my exposure and if I'm infected, there's still a false negative rate of about 67%, and that false negative rate doesn't fall until about three days after onset of symptoms, where there's still, according to this study, it was about eight studies that they looked at that had been 
published to that, uh, when they did this review, there was still about 20% they found of a uh, median false negative rate. So the conclusion of this study was a clinician must take care in interpreting this PCR test, especially in the context that there is high suspicion of COVID-19 based on signs and symptoms. And we've seen patients now that we've even done up the three tests that are negative, but clinically they still had no other explanation for their disease. And these are the patients we're following up now with antibody studies to see if we can document that in retrospect, maybe indeed that illness they had was COVID-19. And this shows you sort of the rise and fall of some of the, the, the studies that we can measure or the, the, t the antibodies and the PCR, or the so-called RNA, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA here, and antigen is shown here, rising and then falling. However, this particular test can stay positive. Now we know out to 90 days, where you're detecting bits and pieces of the virus. And as we'll come back and discuss, the concern is how long does that individual stay infectious? What is the infectivity period, even though you may be, de be detecting bits and pieces of the virus throughout the 90 days, how long is that patient actually going to become infectious? How long do we keep them in isolation? Now, after the infection, at about day seven, we begin to see the initial response of the so-called adaptive immune system, the IgM, becomes detectable. And then finally, on around day 14, the IgG is being produced again by our adaptive immune system or the B cells. And then this IgG could stay positive indefinitely. The IgM often will fall down and become negative maybe around three to six weeks. The, the one uncertainty here, if you have documented antibody, are you protected then from reinfection? Some of the other laboratory studies that we're looking at and we're setting up in some ongoing studies now in our health system. Initially some observational studies about what our experience with this virus has been and some of the lab parameters we're going to try to look at is the LDH here, what's called the high sensitivity C-reactive protein and the lymphocyte count, a low lymphocyte count. And the LDH is a reflection of tissue damage. This so-called high sensitivity C-reactive protein is a reflection of the degree of inflammation. And then finally, a low lymphocyte count reflects the immune deficiency that can be associated with this infection. And when you have a very high LD, have a very high CRP, and have a low lymphocyte count, these are parameters that have been, at least in this study, associated with uh, a fatal outcome. Well, let's look at therapies that we now have available. If we look at the stages of illness, clinical symptoms, clinical signs, potential therapies as shown here, um, you can see right now we, we have available remdesivir, which has been released based on some preliminary data that showed that it did speed up recovery from disease. They did not show statistically that it decreased mortality. It was it's speculated that if they could have extended out the numbers of studies, that maybe they could have statistically have shown decreased mortality. Based on the data they had, you would have to treat about 28 patients to save one life with remdesivir. But again, an ongoing uh, st uh, look at remdesivir in what we call the experimental studies, the double-blinded randomized studies. There's about 272 studies still going on with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, some of the preliminary data suggests that it's not effective, but again, there's a lot of criticism of some of that data that's been released, and we're uh, still waiting for that data. Uh, in general, we don't look at this as an effective drug at this point in time, but awaiting additional information to clarify, because some of the early reports was, and especially in vitro or in the laboratory, it does have an antiviral effect because it's a so-called called ionophore. It increases zinc levels within the cell that can have an, an inhibitory effect on the virus. Convalescent plasma transfusions, I'm presently the principal investigator in our health, and the, the Methodist 
uh, system here uh, to look at convalescent plasma. This is a study that's coordinated through the Mayo Clinic, over a thousand or more study uh, centers now involved. And just this morning I read that th there's a report that's coming out of the CDC that by using convalescent plasma in our patients, you can decrease mortality by 50%. 50%. And it's our, our belief that this will also, uh, and needs to be used earlier on infection, ideally within the first seven, if not 14 days, to try to catch the infection again in the early stage three, if not stage two, while you're still getting viral replication before this hyperinflammatory or host inflammatory response phase. Also yesterday in one of our, in our ID meeting, we were discussing earlier in the week, there was another study that was published where it documented that the use of steroid therapy, and specifically it was dexamethasone at six milligrams daily for 10 days, decreased the risk of dying, especially if you were on a mechanical ventilator. And if you were on a mechanical ventilator, it decreased your risk of dying by about one third, by one third. Also, it decreased the chance of dying if you just simply required oxygen therapy. If you did not require respiratory support, it did not appear to have an effect on outcome. So those are some of the tools we presently have in our, our toolbox. But I would direct you to what's called the trial tracker here by Cytel. And this is a uh, tracking system. You can go online. It shows you like with hydroxychloroquine, there's 272 studies ongoing. Uh, it tells you the number of studies going on. You can track into this in terms of the country and specific studies to get an update on where we are at. Now, in addition to antiviral therapy, there are ongoing vaccine trials. And actually, there's over 100 of these that are proposed. Uh, this morning, I, I read that the government has uh, provided federal funding for a certain number of these. It's around five to seven. Uh, and specifically, there's three companies now that are going to be launching phase three trials, um, as shown with this report from the Center Watch. Uh, Moderna uh, will initiate a so called phase three trial. They've been through the phase one and two trials where they've looked at animals and initially human studies to make sure it's safe and looking at, at efficacy, but now initiating these larger studies in terms of randomized double-blinded studies where they're going to give certain individuals the vaccine and certain individuals a placebo and then look at ongoing efficacy and safety in those patient populations. So Moderna will be involved, Johnson & Johnson, as, as well as the Oxford um, um, company that's teaming up with AstraZeneca. So it's been predicted that maybe we'll have a vaccine by the end of the year, but again, we really need to await the data that will come out of these scientific studies to, again, be sure we have a vaccine that's safe and effective. Some are hypothesizing that the initial vaccines may not prevent infection, but may help decrease significantly the risk of dying of COVID-19. Well, so with that as the background of of where we're at, how can I protect myself from COVID-19? I like to refer to this slide, Stephen Covey, and many of you may have read this book he published in 1989, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And his concept was to develop effective habits. You need to look at everything around you and then identify the fact that you're going to have concerns and worries, but then focus on what you can influence and what you can actually totally control. Because as you focus on those factors that you can control or influence, and you increase those circles, you decrease that circle of concern and worry. The hierarchy of controls then we apply for COVID-19 or the traditional hierarchy of controls going from the most effective to the least effective. We know by totally eliminating the virus such as with SARS-CoV-1 after 2004, we didn't need to worry about the virus. We had eliminated it. 
So that was no longer a concern. But with SARS-CoV-2, as, as you, we've led you to believe, this is ongoing at this point in time. So we come down. There's really no substitution that's applicable here. But engineering controls, we're having to look at ventilation. As I shared with the patient the other day, I showed her that each room in our COVID-19 unit, every room I could show her that the ventilation and how long it takes to clear the air of the virus at a 99.9% level and kind of reassured her that we're looking at ventilation. And this becomes important too if you think about going out now like to a grocery store or a more enclosed space, like at a restaurant, cafe. I read this morning an outbreak in a bar where there's 17 people got infected from a, from a person. That more enclosed spaces, especially if people aren't wearing masks, you're going to increase your risk then of getting infected. A home setting is always a concern, and infectious rates there may be around 20 to 25 percent or increased versus uh, op more open spaces. Uh, so the home setting would be another example of a more enclosed space. Then we look at administrative controls. And I should add our administration has been extremely supportive as we've stepped through initially preparing before we saw our first patient. And ever since, multiple meetings and extreme support, uh, updates and everything. Uh, and, and thus administrative support and controls become important in terms of identifying which healthcare workers should stay at home, uh, which healthcare workers can continue to uh, work, and then also supporting making sure that all our healthcare workers are staying safe through so-called PPE, or personal protective equipment. And learning to don and duff our PPE in a safe manner becomes very important. We have observers to be sure and I'm always, I feel more secure too, having somebody look at me donning my PPE and then duffing my PPE to decrease my risk of acquiring infection. So we've hinted at this so-called infectious period. So an individual is infected. There's an incubation period, as we've noted, with a median of about four to five days or up to two to 14 days. An individual can become infectious, though, and start to shed virus, even if they are in the pre-symptomatic phase. Some of these, again, stay asymptomatic. Maybe about 40% of patients stay asymptomatic, and it's believed they may be infectious for about eight days, including um, from, um, starting during that incubation period. Those that are in the pre-symptomatic phase, it appears that starting around two days, some still feel that maybe even up to five days, these individuals may be infectious. Some limited data suggests that after 10 days of becoming symptomatic, you may no longer be able to spread infectious virus. However, others have raised a concern, and among our uh, epidemiology group nationally, there's a, there's a conservative wing of where we feel that possibly even maintaining isolation in our more critically ill patients till we have more data should be uh, follow for up perhaps, to, and what we're following is 28 days, up to 28 days after becoming symptomatic. And in part, the infectiousness relates to the viral load as shown here. And this is still under study, but the transmission, especially uh, starting two to five days before onset of, of symptoms, and then out to at least 10 days, appear to be the more vulnerable period uh, of, or a higher risk period of virus shedding. Can you continue to shed infectious virus out to even four weeks? Uh, uncertain, but again, we're concerned, especially in those that are more seriously ill in the hospital setting. So how can I protect myself? Well, washing hands is important. Touching a potential fomite, the environment where there's virus, and then touching your eyes, nose, or mouth may it's a plausible route of transmission. Avoiding touching your face with unwashed hands. Certainly all need the rubber eyes at times, so just perform good hand hygiene before you rub your eyes. Avoid close contact with people who are sick, especially within that six feet. And following national, state, and local guidelines regarding travel restrictions.
our state health department through our governor and also at the CDC level have ongoing updated guidelines concerning travel and we provide these guidelines to our healthcare workers as well. The last item on this slide, and I hate the word or the term social distancing. We really need physical or smart distancing. We need social connection right now, which we'll come back and discuss. But practicing social or physical distancing, staying more than six feet away from people, especially when you're in enclosed environments. But even if you're out on a trail maybe or walking in the woods, I would still advocate trying to keep that spatial separation. Fortunately, when you're outdoors, there's much less of a chance of getting those higher viral inocula that could lead to disease. This was a recent publication in Environmental International with the headline, Airborne Transmission of SARS-CoV-2, The World Should Face the Reality. And they pointed out that it's extremely important that the national authorities acknowledge the reality that the virus spreads through the air. And this from that publication showing you what is believed to happen. There's always these larger droplets, and we mentioned these larger droplets are about five microns in size or larger, and they can spread maybe for about three to six feet, and then they fall to the ground, potentially contaminating the floor or other fomites potentially. And then there's these smaller droplet nuclei, less than five microns that can spread for prolonged distances. This is a blog that I would encourage everybody to look up and read. Aaron Bromage is a professor at Dartmouth and he has really, and he teaches a course on this, and really takes a close look at what we believe is going on and understanding about the spread of this virus. The risks, know them, avoid them. He starts out, it seems many people are breathing some relief, and I'm not sure why. Let's look at some of the, the information he provides. Successful COVID-19 infection is directly related to the exposure or the amount of virus exposure times the time of exposure. It's believed that perhaps as few as 1,000 SARS-CoV-2 infectious viral particles can lead to infection and subsequent disease in a patient. As he notes, we know that at least 44% of all infections occur in asymptomatic patients or remain asymptomatic or patients without any symptoms. And you can be shedding the virus into the environment for at least two days, if not up to five days before symptoms begin. Also, remembering that you can be and remain asymptomatic and shedding the virus for a period of about eight days. He also goes on to identify high-risk areas, bathrooms, high-touch surfaces, seem to be especially noteworthy in his thoughts. And he goes on and reinforces that these high-touch areas can become contaminated and frequently people, you don't like to think about it, they don't wash their hands and the next thing they're touching high risk areas and they touch their eyes, nose, or mouth. Also this morning was another reinforcement of how it's believed that whenever you flush the toilet, you get infectious clouds of droplets spread into the air. So bathrooms in general may be one of those higher risk areas. And also those air dryers, and this came out in the last year, those air dryers that you see suck in the air and you try to dry your hands underneath and they found significant amounts of E. coli being blown onto your hands. So again, he focused on bathrooms. A single cough releases about 3,000 droplets, 3,000 droplets that contain potentially infectious viral particles. And these droplets, when you cough, can travel about 50 miles per hour. And with a cough, you can actually project the smaller aerosol or the droplet nuclei up to about 19 feet, it appears. A single sneeze doubles our tenfold increase, 30,000 droplets. And those droplets with a sneeze can propel 200 miles per hour and travel up to about 27 feet. Again, the smaller droplet nuclei versus those larger droplets, again, are going to fall within three to six feet. 
This kind of reminds me, I hadn't been in to a grocery store for a couple months and I was out the other day at the local grocery store waiting in line to be checked out. There was this guy behind me without a mask on, he coughs. Now he did practice a little cough etiquette, I could see, but I asked him to move over to the couple lines next door. <laughs> I held my breath a little bit, but I had my mask on, so I felt a little reassured. But again, it's this type of interaction that I get concerned about as we go out and open up, so to speak, that we're not going to be able to return the normal. This is a good video to look at out at National Geographic. You can sign up and there's a lot of freebies now on National Geographic if you sign up without getting a subscription. This is by Lydia Baruba, but she shows you this high-speed video that you can go on and look at with a, a sneeze launching the larger droplets here shown in green up to maybe six feet, but these smaller droplet nuclei again going up to 27 feet. If a person is infected, the droplets in a single cough or sneeze may contain as many as 200 million virus particles. 200 million virus particles. A single breath may release 50 to 5,000 droplets. And again, these droplets containing potentially infectious virus. Speaking will increase the release of respiratory droplets about tenfold. So it's believed in speaking that we can model so you have about 20 infectious viral particles per minute potentially. And so you need, if you're within six feet of somebody, that's where we come up with this guideline then if you've been within six feet of somebody greater than 10 minutes, you're probably going to be exposed to at least 1,000, if not up to 2,000, possibly more infectious viral particles, and thus you're at risk for infection. And Robert Schooley, who was one of the original clinicians that I was involved with HIV and so on, had this publication reinforcing how a large proportion of the spread of coronavirus appears to be occurring through airborne transmission of aerosols produced by asymptomatic individuals during breathing and speaking and reinforcing now why we have guidelines at the CDC and state level of universal masking. That if you're infected but still asymptomatic, you're gonna, if you're wearing a mask, that will decrease the risk. However, this is maximal exposure here as you can see versus this person who's infected wearing a mask and the, uh, this person wearing a mask, you're going to have even decreased exposure, although there's still going to be some ongoing exposure. So universal masking may play an important role as we open up in decreasing ongoing spread of this infection. So masking protects your community, not just you. We need universal masking at this point in time. Now, one might ask, as in Germany, where they're checking antibody tests, if you have an antibody for COVID-19, you get a certificate. If you got a certificate, maybe would you be able to go out without a mask on? You know, there's these theoretical uh, scenarios that we could develop. Well, how do I keep from spreading illness to others if I am sick beyond wearing a mask? Well, stay home if you're sick. If you have any symptoms of COVID-19, stay home, call your physician. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue, then throw that tissue in a trash. And we've also looked at kind of coughing in your sleeve. I never particularly like this because I've always looked at the sleeve then as a fomite or potentially containing infectious virus. So to me, it's better to cough into a tissue and dispose of that and then do good hand hygiene. Regularly clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. And call ahead to the, your healthcare professional if you're developing symptoms. Just don't simply run in, but call so they can triage you. Possibly you have symptoms now that would direct you to an emergency department. And, and the last thing you want to be doing is going in with COVID-19 into an office and exposing others within that office setting. Well, who's at the highest risk for COVID-19? Well, this is a list of those at higher risk. We know age. We know underlying chronic medical conditions are putting these patients at risk. Moderate risk are outlined here. Even those 20 to 64 years of age seem to be at somewhat increased risk, uh, especially if they have chronic medical conditions. And then 
younger individuals seem to be at less risk, although as you've been reading, there's this PIMS or pediatric inflammatory multi-system syndrome that's behaving kind of like a so-called illness called Kawasaki disease, but an inflammatory state associated with COVID-19 in our younger children. So we're in a day and age where there is this pandemic, another pandemic. So we have a pandemic of COVID-19 superimposed on this other so-called pandemic of chronic diseases that become likened to this growing ugly tree. These chronic inflammatory diseases as a cause of mortality have replaced infectious diseases, along with increasing chronic medical conditions, including diabetes, inflammatory diseases like Crohn's, autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, increasing weight. It's estimated by the year 2030 that 50% of our population is going to have a BMI greater than 30. We know being overweight in itself causes chronic inflammation and increases your risk of dying of COVID-19. In this so-called pandemic, if we look at this year 2017 by the CDC, over 600,000 deaths from cardiovascular disease that year with malignant or cancers, over six, approaching 600,000 deaths. So a pandemic of chronic diseases in traditional medicine, what we try to do is offer a pill for an ill or cut off a branch, as you see here. But I like this cartoon that the Sonnenberg showed in one of their presentations from Stanford. Great news, Captain. You can inform the passengers we have slowed the rate of sinking. Again, these chronic medical conditions, ugly tree growing, growing, we just keep trying to cut off the branches while we get more and more chronic medical disease. Well, what are the root causes of these trends? Is there a unifying theory that we could offer for this pandemic, again, of chronic diseases? Well, many feel that the unifying theory, even though there's multiple factors, including strange chemicals we're exposed to, our sedentary lifestyle, over hygiene, the antibiotics that wipe out our so-called microbiome that may be our first line of defense, chronic stress. We feel that diet may well play a unifying root cause of, again, these chronic medical conditions. This was a slide now that's somewhat outdated, but COVID-19 death rate by age group. Again, the CDC in publishing who is vulnerable showed that in the United States, up to 20% of individuals with cardiovascular disease, lung disease, diabetes, up to 20% were dying of their COVID-19 illness. Hypertension, we know, is a risk factor underlying cancer. So those vulnerable patients are those with these chronic medical conditions. Why do these conditions serve as a factor for dying from COVID-19? Well, we have to ask what constitutes poor metabolic health because it's poor metabolic health or metabolic dysfunction that leads to chronic medical disease. And there's five main metrics that are looked at. One is your blood sugar balance, the blood sugar levels that you're running. Do you have pre or uh, prediabetes or diabetes? Your, high, your blood pressure is the second metric. Your belly circumference, belly fat, which again is associated with chronic inflammation, is a determinant of your metabolic health. And then two lipid metrics. Do you have a high triglyceride level or a low HDL level, which is a protective lipid versus triglyceride is a marker of, again, metabolic dysfunction. The prevalence of optimum metabolic health in American adults was published last year in this survey over a year period of time in 2009 and 2016. The question was, how many Americans have optimal metabolic health? What was found was striking, that overall only 12%, 12% of Americans have optimal metabolic health based on those five metrics we just looked at. You can see the difference in gender, 
And then by age, if you were 60 years of age or older, you only had 2 or 2.1% optimal metabolic health. Thus, based on that, up to 80 or 98% of our population in this country, older than 60, may be vulnerable to COVID-19. Well, why do these chronic diseases, again, serve as a risk factor? Well, they're diseases of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is where we take three of those five metrics and combine them together, and that is now what's defined as metabolic syndrome. So having three of those five really increases your risk. But as we're seeing, even one of these metrics, like having high blood pressure, diabetes, appears to significantly increase your risk of dying of COVID-19. All these medical conditions, which are really chronic inflammatory conditions, travel with excess adipose tissue or a BMI, especially at 30 or greater. But excess fatty tissue is not the cause because less than a third of normal weight individuals, again, less than one third of normal weight individuals are metabolically healthy with that prevalence then decreasing to 8% and 0.5% in overweight and obese individuals. But what these conditions appear to serve as markers for two underlying cellular pathologies, things that are going on at the cell level. Number one, insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, insulin is a major hormone that controls our body's metabolism. It determines if you lay down fat or you burn fat. If you have insulin resistance, you're not going to be able to effectively lose weight and keep it off. This is associated with the inability of cells, especially the liver, to respond to that insulin signal. It, it impairs the response of the kidney. If you have insulin resistance, the kidney cannot respond appropriately. You hold on the sodium, hold on the water, and you get hypertension. The second marker that is important to note is what we call mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are all those little powerhouses in our cells that produce the energy. When you are in a chronic inflammatory state, your body goes into a danger mode state and signaling is sent to the mitochondria to slow down the production of energy and go again into a danger mode where they're communicating to your immune system and it kind of begets more inflammation in a vicious cycle. And, and what's behind Behind all this appears to be what we call oxidative stress, oxidative stress, these free oxygen radicals, and thus we get into an imbalance, a metabolic imbalance, where this oxidative stress is causing damage, causing DNA damage, inability to produce stem cells, and so on, which then leading to these chronic medical conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune disease, and so on. So these individuals are already in a chronic inflammatory, a high cytokine state, which then is behind driving these chronic diseases. Then if you throw COVID-19 on top of these chronic medical conditions, you get a tsunami of inflammation. Your inflammatory status appears to be the best signal predictor of survival. And what worsens this inflammation? What is then leading to this chronic inflammation, this oxidative stress at the cell level. Well, it's believed that it's processed foods. And my patients say, you, well, you mean junk food? I say, yes, junk food. Food that has two major factors that predispose you to chronic medical condition. They are nutrient poor, nutrient poor, and they lack or they contain certain toxins, certain toxins, or some refer to these even as poisons. So they lack nutrient uh, content and they, lack, they have poison. So here if we go on the trajectory of the so-called standard American diet or SAD, as shown here, we see these foods that are very poor in nutrient uh, content and contain certain poisons. And what do I mean by poisons or toxins? Well, there's four processed nutrient deficient foods, four processed nutrient deficient foods, or the characteristics of these foods that have changed the world's diet, including SAD in this country. And that includes refined added sugars, refined grains or white wheat flour, these so-called 
factory fats or polyunsaturated vegetable oils or PUFAs that are high in omega-6. And then the artificial created trans fats or hydrogenated oils. Now, as you know, the government has now banned trans fats. A problem with that is that even though they have banned it, when you're purchasing these polyunsaturated vegetable oils, there can still be a certain content of trans fats. Trans fats are poisonous to our system. It's felt by many others now. There's a devil's triangle here, or triad. And that devil's triad is sugar, refined grains, and these factory fats. That all of these appear to be toxic, if not poisonous, to our, our system. This is a timeline for processed food introductions. Turns out that sugar increases actually date back to about 1822. The first factory fat that was introduced, or seed oil, or high omega-6, and these are oils which, again, can be readily oxidized, and because they come into our bodies oxidized, they just add to that oxidative stress. And this was introduced back in 1865 as we entered into early 1900s, soybean oils were introduced. And then finally, Crisco in 1911, if, and maybe many of you are young enough not to remember this, but I grew up with Crisco. My mother thought, wow, I'm going to get away from lard and cooking with Crisco. Little did she know she was poisoning us at that time with these trans fats associated with Crisco, which again now is banned. If we Zoom ahead to 2009, you can see that about 63% of our U.S. food consumption is processed food. Processed food that is nutrient poor and contains added sugar, contains factory fats, which again we feel are probably poisonous to our body's metabolism. So processed foods, if we summarize, as Rob Lustig does, and if you've never listened to Rob Lustig's TED talk that goes back over 10 years ago entitled Sugar, the Bitter Truth. Sugar, the Bitter Truth. You need to go back. There's over 10 million people that have reviewed that now. But Rob Lustig notes that the three inherent problems associated with processed food, excess omega-6 fatty acids, which are pro-inflammatory, lack of omega-3s or uh, oily fish that are anti-inflammatory, and then excess sugar, virtually all processed food has excess sugar. And as he notes, it's the fructose or fructose that is especially toxic to our systems because only the liver can metabolize fructose. And it takes relatively little fructose to get over that level that becomes toxic to the liver. And the liver in metabolizing fructose translates that into eye high triglycerides, insulin resistance, elevated uric acid levels, and so on. And leading to what we call mitochondrial dysfunction, failure of our mitochondria that provide energy because they've gone into the danger mode. And again, leading then to increased chance of dying of COVID-19. Well, to summarize then, if we look at a growing plant, these are the things that appear then, these chronic medical conditions, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. And as we've likened, this may not be such a, a pretty plant, but more of an ugly tree that's growing. What drives these chronic medical conditions, I should add, this is a talk from Mark Pettis. Uh, I kind of edited this, and it's worth going to some of his presentations as well to understand the, the details behind this, but core metabolic imbalances, which include then the chronic inflammation, the oxidative stress, the mitochondrial disruption, insulin resistance, as we'll come back and talk about what's called leaky gut or intestinal permeability, is also behind these chronic diseases or one of the so-called core metabolic imbalances and what's driving them. And then the root causes. We go back to environmental issues, including toxin exposure, but to all those other lifestyle habits, if you will, the environmental issues, the, the nutrition, what you're eating, exercise, stress, social interaction, sleep. And I like this way of depicting then life. And Mark shows this slide that we have these environmental factors that are ongoing then, and that interacts with what we call now our epigenome. These environmental factors determine 
gene regulation, upregulation, or downregulation. It determines are, are inflammatory genes upregulated and active, like a light switch turned on, or are they downregulated into a more balanced inflammatory or metabolic state? Acute inflammation can be very important, especially as we're fighting off infection, but it's that chronic inflammatory state that then is associated with chronic inflammatory medical conditions or metabolic conditions. So the epigenome is this whole new science of genes being turned on or off. And then that interacts with our recently discovered organ, which some of you heard me talk about, which is the center of our bioscience endeavor right now, the microbiome, which I think is the first line of defense, all these bacteria in and on our body. Because if we count up all the human cells, 30 trillion human cells, we have at least 39 trillion bacterial cells in and on our body. So we're only about 43% human when we look at life, which is then right in the center of those three intersecting circles. And surrounding that is our, our consciousness, our spirit that goes beyond Newtonian physics, but that also has a great impact on the center of life. As Hippocrates said, we now understand why all disease begins in the gut, because it's this gut microbiome. This has changed and led to a paradigm shift in what we now understand about bacteria, and this is from the Sonnenbergs. One of the prettiest pictures I've seen of the colon microbiome is shown here. These are all the bacteria, again, up to 38 trillion bacteria within your colon alone. And the bacteria that we harbor actually have up to greater than 100 times more genes than human genes. We have about 20,000 human genes, and it's estimated we have 100 times, if not more, bacterial genes. We share about 99.9% of our human genome. But if we look at our own individual human microbiome, and that's all the bacteria, in addition we have viruses, fungi, and parasites, but if we look at the bacterial microbiome, we only share, at a, in terms of bacterial genes, at a 20% level. So it's kind of like a fingerprint that you can identify individuals now based on their microbiome. Well, it's becoming more important who's there, what are they doing, because we now understand that the intestinal microbiota controls our body's metabolism. It determines your weight, determines the balance of your immune system. It has a very important role earlier in life, in those first three years of life, in determining uh, our immune system. Are we going to be prone to allergies uh, and so on? It also determines our brain uh, behavior, our personality. And there's this so-called gut-brain axis that's there where there's bi-directional communication between the gut and brain. We do know that the microbiota, like any growing plant, de depends on nutrients, nutrition, just like we depend on nutrients. And the plant food is, a, is fiber and, and resistant starches, both insoluble and soluble fiber. Again, the, this blue here is our colonocytes. Here are the bacteria. Here are the mucus that normally protects us from the bacteria. And here actually is fiber that was ingested. It's been said that fences make good neighbors. Mucus may play a very important role in protecting us and keeping a balance. And here is a fiber deficient diet. And I should add, this is a mice or a mouse model. And this really mimics what is believed to go on in the human. So if you lack this fiber, you can see then what happens is you begin to lose that the, the density of the fence or the mucus, and these bacteria then begin to encroach upon the territory right next to your epithelium, the single cell of protection that we have. And then this leads to inflammation, and then it leads to breakdown in the junctions of those epithelial cells, or what we call the tight junctions, and you get what's called leaky gut. And 70% of the immune system's there, and thus triggering and not only an acute inflammatory response, but can then beget an ongoing chronic inflammatory response. So we have gut dysbiosis that occurs or an imbalance in the microbiome. This then can disrupt not only the gut immune homeostasis or balance, but now we believe this leads to ongoing inflammation throughout the body, the danger signal sent to mitochondria, and thus perhaps behind many of the chronic medical conditions that we're now seeing.
So to conclude, what can we do for immune support? Well, if lifestyle factors can affect immune function and affect epigenetics, and again, hectic stressful lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, um, and these other factors, uh, including smoking, sleep disturbances, excessive alcohol, which can be toxic, um, all the poor diet here leading the suboptimal nutritional status, other life uh, cell factors leading the compromised immune function. We really feel maybe central to what's behind these chronic medical conditions, again, is our poor diet. And, and to summarize very briefly, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine summarizes the lifestyle choices to boost your immunity for immune support. Mind your stress, healthy live, eating, being active, moderate exercise, no smoking, quality sleep, and then social connectivity. So our food should be our medicine, and our medicine should be our food. Tim Spector, who is a researcher out of London, published this blog. Recent research has shown that the gut microbiome plays an essential role in the body's immune response to infection and maintaining overall health. As well as monitoring a response to infectious pathogens such as coronavirus, a healthy gut microbiome helps to prevent potentially dangerous immune overreactions or, again, this so-called cytokine storm. So in, in general, we agree that Americans need to be feeding their microbiota with fiber, resistant starch. The USDA, Harvard, Mayo Clinic, eat more fiber. Tim Spector has written about this in his book, The, um, the, the Diet Myth, and his so-called checkout, we are all different. Each of us responds to food differently. There needs to be a bio-individualized approach, we now know. But foods high in sugars, processed foods, factory fats, are bad for our, micro, our microbes. And we'll be coming back and kind of going into greater detail of how all these environmental factors, including stress, lack of exercise, but especially these sugars and factory fats can harm your microbiome, put it into an imbalanced state or what's called an inflammatory microbiome profile. Diets high in vegetables are good for you. And we, are, um, we need the rainbow of vegetables, as he reinforces. And Michael Pollan, who is a journalist, who has written about nutrition and it's important. And this is one of uh, a book that goes back some time, The Ultimate Diet, still is applicable, I think, uh, today. Eat wholesome foods, mostly plants and sensible combinations and not too much. Don't eat anything that your grandmother's microbes would not recognize as food. The more diverse your wholesome diet is, the more diverse your healthy microbiota will be. And then finally, Rob Lustig, again, who gave that TED talk on sugar, um, the bitter truth, just reinforces eat real food. Eat real food that is nutrient dense with minerals, vital, vitamins, flavonoids, polyphenols, and so on that are antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and immune strengthening. Well, let me conclude with what I put together as a checklist of seven S's, or seven things that I think are very important in helping support a healthy, functional core microbiome, which again, I think is your first line of defense, and in return, a balanced immune system. This checklist includes sugar, and we know sugar, like cocaine and alcohol, shares two properties, addiction and toxicity. And when I paused in terms of toxicity, I was thinking, well, you can do excessive cocaine and alcohol, and that can be acutely toxic, but can you really overdose on sugar? Well, if you take too much sugar, you don't really overdose or die, but what we now know and what Rob Lustig reinforces, it causes a chronic toxicity, chronic toxicity that slowly over time weakens you more and more. And like seed oils, and Chris Kenobi is really the one, and I presented a few slides from Chris through this presentation, but Chris reinforces that seed oils like sugar can be chronically toxic to our systems, chronically toxic. In fact, he feels that's more important than even sugar as a toxin. So 
initially eliminate these two S's from your diet and emphasize nutrient dense whole real foods as clean as possible, free of toxins as possible, with nutrient dense foods to provide your microbiome, including healthy fibers and resistant starch, with the nourishment they need to survive and thrive. Sleep becomes important. Sleep also can affect our microbiome. Restorative sleep becomes important in helping maintain a balanced immune system. Stress, chronic stress weakens our immune system. Also signals to our microbiome that there's danger out there. So chronic stress management becomes important. Starting your morning with some mindfulness, maybe prayer, maybe some meditation, maybe yoga, coupled with some exercise. So social interactions become important. Again, I hate the term social distancing. We need social connections and we need physical distancing. But by connecting with others, being able to care for others helps us maintain a more healthy, balanced metabolism and immune system. It, it turns out it makes our microbiome ha happy. And then finally, overcoming the slough factor, lack of exercise. You don't want too little, you don't want too much exercise. Exercise can release substances such as myokines that can stimulate our natural killer cells, help maintain our first line of defense. Exercise has shown here in a publication in 2017 showed you can even reverse some of the, the chronic toxicity of fructose or fructose as shown here where you are having um, uh, a positive effect on countering oxidative stress, on insulin resistance, in helping counter what's called hepatic steatosis or fatty liver uh, and helping counter those lipid disorders that then can lead to a metabolic syndrome. But physical exercise in itself is not enough. You need to consider all these other so-called or uh, these other S's on this list. And then finally, the final S does not relate to fertility, which you may be thinking, but related to supplements, supplements. And th this will be an area that I'll take up in a future talk. But suffice it to say, this is one of the better reviews that I've seen by Sylvia Maginni and colleagues entitled Immune Function and Micronutrient Requirements Change Over a Life Course. As we get seasoned, we begin to become relatively deficient. And in, in now we're even finding in younger individuals deficiencies because of the deficiencies in our soil and perhaps even more importantly, deficiency in our food, and that there are various micronutrients that are critical for immune support. And these are listed here on this slide, the A, C, D, E, B2, B6, B12, folic acid, iron, selenium, and zinc, and especially D3, which is found, uh, or all, all our immune cells have D3 receptors, and the growing importance of, of maybe being sure you're not deficient in vitamin D, maybe, being one of the more critical micronutrients for providing immune support. I always refer patients to this website, consumerlab.com. They do the scientific studies, the, the research to let you know about the science behind these supplements. It's a relatively inexpensive subscription. You can go in and really look at, well, why would I want to take vitamin D? Why would I want to be sure I'm not deficient? How about vitamin A? How about these other micronutrients? And I would refer you to this website to better understand the importance of supplementation. Now, you cannot supplement yourself out of a bad lifestyle, out of a bad lifestyle. You've got to really emphasize, again, healthy lifestyle habits and selectively supplement. In conclusion, the take-home messages from the day brings us back to our beginning. As in the Lancet Infectious Disease Journal, we are writing the corona coaster of uncertainty. The COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented and unpredictable. We know what works to contain it. The hard part is implementing it. We are in need of evidence-based therapies and vaccines, although as we presented, we do have some therapies now that show decreased mortality in our patients, convalescent plasma, 
dexamethasone as a steroid therapy. We have remdesivir as an antiviral that does help speed up recovery. We have vaccines in development. We can build individual resilience through optimizing our metabolic and immune health through healthy lifestyle habits and selective supplementation. But again, we cannot supplement ourselves out of a poor lifestyle habit. We need to develop public trust through honest communication. As I like to end the day and end my talks, just a little treat. And I like to refer to Snoopy here from Charles Schultz that all you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt. But Smudge the Cat also reminds Snoopy, remember, wear your mask if you're out in public. I need to give credit of this artwork to my brother-in-law and niece, Bob Carlson and Greta Carlson. And we actually post this on our office door now to remind our patients, wear a mask. Well, thank you for your attention.